Mr. George. He's watching. Hi, George. Hi, George. No, you, you don't talk to him. I, I, I talk to him. Okay. It's our show. Yes, yeah, Sam. Also, I don't know who George is. Uh, Boy George. It's his birthday it's today. It's his birthday today. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we? Is this. Do we go? I don't know. Is the stream back up or. Yeah, it's not. You don't see us outside? Well, I don't know. That oh, might, yeah. That so, might have not necessarily been watching oh, the stream. It might have been coming. wired up to watch it. Hey. We go. Oh, okay. Oh. Alright. Yeah, just see how the fact the stream is outside. Goodness sake. I wasn't sure if it was just wired up. I wasn't sure if it was watching the stream. Okay, it. let's start. Mm. Hello. Welcome. This is like story making. <laughs> <laughs> to the fan fiction hour, I guess this is called. Um, so, this is our show where we read out some fan fiction, but not fan fiction that we found on the internet. These are fan fictions that have been written especially for this show by members of the Lancaster University Comedy Institute. But not these two. Uh, they didn't bother. Um, um, I'm sorry, but I think I bothered to turn up. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's good enough. They're, they're here to listen and critique. I wrote one in previous years. I, yeah, I, I cut my, my chops, now I'm ready to review. <laughs> I think me and Jake are known for not necessarily listening, but we're known for critiquing a lot of things. Yeah. And boy, do we like critiquing things. <laughs> Especially the society. Yes. Mm. So, um, <laughs> I am your host, Hannah Wesson, defender, lover of all things fan fiction. Uh, this is something I'd like to mention at the start of this show, is that I actually really like fan fiction as a former fan fiction aficionado. When was the last time you wrote fan fiction not for this show? Um, it was 2015. I haven't written 2015, down. 2015, that's not notes. that long ago. It's not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Is that your first year of uni? Maybe. I don't, I don't need like a CBC logo like like right here. <laughs> like a C Also, it still says jury duty at the top. Yeah. Well, we, we, are, we are going to be judging stories. Uh, so, story makers, story makers. So what, um, apart from last year, or whenever it was, we didn't do this show last year, because uh, I couldn't be bothered. I feel like you do some <laughs> kind of, you do your iPod thing normally, don't you? I, I think I've done that once. Okay. So I think it was a bit infamous, well, right. and everyone was like, are you doing that again? And I was like, no. <laughs> I could have done that. It lasted um, a while in people's heads, which is nice. Yeah. But Jake, do you have any experience with fan fiction other than what you wrote? Um... Other than what I wrote, I'm Did you what? ever read any when you were? Um, I've read some while I was trying to see if I could find yours somewhere. Ah. Um, Did you enjoy what you read? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sam, you... Too sexy. <laughs> I know you did Bone Church. Oh, oh God, wait. That. Oh, yeah, the best fan fiction ever. Yeah. I went to a Pokemon Society um, meeting where they did a um, decided to write a fan fiction and made me quite grossly uncomfortable. Oh. Uh, by the end of it. Why was it Pokemon's doing the naughty? Yeah, but it was very, oh. it was very sexually violent, and it wasn't, it wasn't Ooh. that funny. Oh, um, <laughs> it's supposed to be funny. No, I mean they're all laughing at it. I was just like, that's really gross. Like, oh. yeah. So that's why I didn't never went back to that society. Nice. Um, <laughs> it was when Lucy did it. It was quite funny. So that's mm. why I came back. Yeah. Um, and then I also read some on the takeover last year. Ah, oh, okay. Some Megatron Star Scream. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, in your show, yeah. yeah. Well, so my, uh, apart from the things I've written for the society, my fan fiction career uh, lasted. Career? My fan fiction career lasted like, like from. Like North South. Uh, <laughs> Korea. <laughs> lasted from 2011 to 2015. And would you like to know my word count of all the stories added together? Yeah, sure. My yeah. final total, it was 644,870 words. That's, That's so much. I would have guessed yeah. like 50. It's like 10 dissertations now. Yeah. 50. Ranging from the shortest story of just 521 words to 112,194 words. That's like a PhD. Yeah. That's pretty bad. It was all just smut. You could be it a doctor. It wasn't. It you wasn't could be a doctor <laughs> with that, 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 like, that, that effort. I'm a doctor of fan fiction. We're no, you're not there. a doctor of anything. That's the sad fact <laughs> of that. We're all the Hitaria one smut and all the. Um, Whose line ones are not smut? Pretty much. No, not all the Hitalia ones were smut. But all the smut was Hitalia. Right. I think I drew the line at smut about real life people. Okay. Um, so, we're going to read our first fan fiction. It's very short. Ooh. Like, literally, it's, it's that is short. like, yeah, it's really short. I don't know what it's about because it's by Fiamma. She didn't tell me what the topic was. So, I guess we'll just find out 
as we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but no, nobody knew that me and Hit Jake would be on the show, right? So it might involve us or not. Maybe. Um, there's no title. <laughs> okay. Mm. Adam didn't want to get into the car, but he knew it was the best thing to do. It was going to be cheaper, and he really couldn't afford to waste money. You spent a lot of time with Ronan already. This is not going to be any different, he told himself walking towards the BMW. Ronan was sitting in the car, his wrists dripping over the steering <laughs> wheel, cigarette in hand. He didn't acknowledge Adam, just stretched himself over the seat to open the door for him. <laughs> they drove in silence out of Henrietta and into the highway. Wait, wait, out of Henrietta, that's what it says! <laughs> Ronan lighting cigarettes with the end of their <coughs> predecessors. Adam looking out of the window, wishing to be somewhere else. Adam knew the whole journey could have been spent in silence if he didn't take matters into his own hands. He took a deep breath. So, how are things, Ro? He asked. Ronan violently steered into the other lane, killing them both instantly. Oh, he would not stand for such a nickname. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone know... What that was about? Nope. <laughs> Does anyone know Adam and Ronan? No. Nope. <laughs> me, me neither. <coughs> That's a really good ending. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just. I don't know if she made up. Does she know what fan fiction is? I didn't. I didn't know what, Maybe That's she just picked two names. I'm gonna That's a really good twist. I'm gonna Google Adam. <laughs> yeah, Ronan please do. That's an M Night Shyamalan. No, no, he ever it wasn't a person. It sounds like a place. Yeah, that's why I assume. But yeah, so Adam. Yeah. I don't know what that was for, but uh, I enjoy. I'd like a twist. Yeah. I like a surprise. I mean. uh, looks Anything? like it might be something called the Raven Boys. Raven Boys is that an Italian thing? <coughs> yeah. We know about Raven. Yama is Italian. Remember Raven? Yeah, the show. Did the challenge begin. Guy, it's... my guy, I worked with went on it when he was a kid. Really? Yeah, we put it on the office. It was really weird. <laughs> do you know what I think about Raven is? And the way they did a way to roll it, you could always tell when they're about to die because the music would be like, did 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 did. <laughs> and then you can always tell the cue when they're going to die was and then they would die at that point you can always tell uh, yeah apparently it's a series of books by Maggie Steve Potter <sighs> okay that's, that's quite niche I, wanna, I was expecting uh, it's not niche yeah. I was expecting Harry Potter or something but fair enough Aren't we all expecting Harry Potter or something? I'm always expecting Harry Potter, especially yeah. nowadays. Yeah. With JK going off the plot a bit. Um, all our work is fan fiction now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our next, I'm not. Our, we're gonna we're gonna have a fun fact. <laughs> That's you, what we're doing. Yeah, delivery of fun facts. Fun facts. <laughs> we're Did gonna you? have a fun <laughs> fact. <laughs> I am fun. Okay. I am uh, fun. Facts. <laughs> Did you know? That the longest work of fiction ever written is a Super Smash Brothers fan fiction. Really? Yeah. How long is it? It's called uh, it's called the Subspace Emissaries World Conquest. Hello, Cesar. Hello, I'm Zara here. Zara is joining us. Yes. When well, you're just in that. time for our fun facts. Yeah, that's fun facts. I was I was listening to it about the Smash Brothers. What is yeah. it? Yeah. Tell me. It's tell called me. the Subspace Emissaries World's Conquest, oh, and no. it currently stands at four million one hundred and four thousand three hundred and twenty-eight words. That's so long. Person, How many eight words are, 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 are is that? I have no idea. But is it, it smutty or not? Like, I don't. Cause no, because it's only got a T rating, which wait, is fanfiction.net means no smut. I would actually quite like to read that. I can send you the link later. Would that be longer than a book? An a, a book, it's yes. Like a novel. Like a, no, it's, it's like the longest a... work of fiction ever. No book oh. yeah. out beats it. Oh. No book is longer than that. <laughs> Not fan fiction, fiction, fiction period. Fiction, fiction. Oh. It includes 221 chapters. It was first published on fanfiction.net on the 5th of March 2008 and was last updated on the 12th of June 2018. So it's been going on for 10 years. So it's, it's not, not finished? It's I'm not finished. Oh, yeah. As far yeah. as I'm one aware. One person or? One person. One dude. And I thought One Piece Jake, was long. how do you find the time to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, have a lot of spare time. So, so I love Smash Bros. So he's, he's never put his age on his profile. <laughs> when I actually went digging, I found an interview with him. It was posted in 2013, and the article states that he was 21. So he would have been around 16 when he started, and in the last update, he's now tw he's tw he was 26. So... <laughs> See, the thing is, right, Super Smash Brothers, if you want to come up with, like, a name for it, there's probably definitely a smut run out there. But, mm. like, Super Smash Bros is, like, you know, a smash, like a smut name in itself. Yeah. Because yeah. bro's got a smash. 
Hey, yo. Hey. I'm not. No. 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 I'm gonna. I, I want to read. I'm not gonna read a lot of it, but I'm gonna read. What I want to do is I want to read a bit, an extract from chapter one. Okay, so when he's when he's sixteen, an extract from the most recent chapter. And I want us to see. That's sure, clever. in ten years, his writing style must have drastically, like, improved. Mark has gone worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find do, 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 do. Out. No, I'm not vet again. I'm not vet this. <laughs> I am so sorry. If this is the worst thing, ever. No, it isn't. Yeah. But we'll find out. We'll see. Mm. So this is chapter's called. What's called chapter one? Start of disc one. New game. It had been a long battle for survival, but he managed to stop the imbeciles from defeating him for real. Taboo, though, had been weakened during the battle. As he floated along in the void of subspace, surrounded by darkness, swirling purple and blue colours, he reflected on the disastrous end of the battle. Master Hand had shown up right before Taboo could terminate the big group of smashers. As a last-ditch attempt, the omnipotent Hand used his space-bending powers to recall each one of the smashers to their worlds, Back into the past before they participated in the brawl tourney and the war against the subspace army. He then called Crazy Hand, and both of them escaped from Taboo's clutches, effectually putting a sudden end to the conflict, conflict for the time being. Unfortunately, not everything was right. Master Hand couldn't manage to save certain smashers. Roy, Pichu, and Mewtwo had been killed by Taboo oh during battle. They come not, back then, don't they? They've not just turned into trophies, <laughs> only killed. Because yeah, that's probably the story to explain why they're not in Brawl, right? <laughs> but, like, but they did come back in a later version, so uh, it's pretty sad. So based on real life? <coughs> yeah, or maybe the story reflects that. In I think version. it does. I think it follows the game like That's Brawl. pretty cool. It's <laughs> pretty cool, you got to say. So let's, let's have a look at... So this is the most recent chapter, chapter 221. So it's ten years in between. I'm gonna place a bet that it's gone worse. Okay, we'll see. So then, does that mean that at some point when Smash Four was released, Roy revives? It, I, I'm guessing well, it's not this long. People are gonna die and revive several hundred <laughs> times, so it's, <laughs> a, it's a given, really. I mean, within the Dome of Vines, the six fighters faced off against the Rocky Kraglalash. Rocky Hard. Pitt took the frontal line first, just as Meta Knight joined his side. We've got the number advantage, you guys. <laughs> he may be big and thick, but we, can, <laughs> but we can chip off his body little by little, Pitt encouraged the team. If Kragalanch can break each one of you down in one smack, he's been practicing his fighting routine very hard lately. Verdi boasted. Kragalanch smashed down the humans first, especially the annoying team with the funny mage getup. Phew. Thoughts? Yeah, it's gone worse. Yeah, when you say guys. Oh, wait, this is the new. It's, it's the most recent, so oh, it's a okay. year old, but it was 10 years after the first. Oh. I think I preferred the first chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. it wasn't I'm, very good either. But. <laughs> no. I reckon the more he's done it, the more it's only people that enjoy it that are reading it, so they all just tell him it's yeah. good because they enjoy it anyway. Mm. So there's no. I mean, I did. I had a look through some of the reviews because you can leave reviews on stories. Uh, one of the first reviews he ever got, so back in 2008, the first one, it was just, this is awesome. Um, but then I saw one posted like a year ago, and it was just like someone had copy and post, copy and pasted the entire mo script to the B movie. <laughs> what? And just left it in there. So. Um, Wait, don't you have like a war limit for the comments? Apparently not. No. <laughs> uh, I also I just enjoy I enjoy some of the chapter names. Uh, it's chapter 38 is called Hedgehogs of Evil. <laughs> Chap Meow. Chapter 39 is uh, unnecessary rock and roll. I mean, it is unnecessary. It is <laughs> All rock necessary. and roll is unnecessary. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, you both take that back. <laughs> Chap chapter 41, Roy is not our boy. So he must not, come not, back. Not is in all capitals. Again, I think I think this follows, like, as you said, the, the lore, like, in Melee, Roy, Mewtwo, and Pichu, like, disappear when they go to Brawl. And now they're back on the game. I so. did not know that. Alright, so. Ch chapter 28 I mean, is wait. fact, colon, Yoshi likes sports. I'm gonna do some maths, okay? Right. I'm gonna do some maths. Is yeah. that after he suddenly appeared in a Mario and Sonic at the Olympic <laughs> Games? Yeah. Um, okay, right. Oh, this okay. is a good one. Chapter 92, the return of Daddy Lucario? Question mark? <laughs> Happy. <laughs> right. So, if you tell me how many words are there again, I'm gonna convert seconds. Okay. So, if you count one word, Per second, okay, which okay. probably would be yeah. Right, it's four million. Yeah. Hundred and two thousand. Yeah. Three hundred and twenty-eight. So four one oh two three two eight. Uh, one oh two. Two three eight. Wait, 
Was that four one or two three two eight? Yeah. Okay. Um. What was it? Okay, so it's four. Okay, forty seven straight days of your life just reading that. If if. I, I'm not a pretty fast word count. Mm. Yeah. 20, 24 hour take well, on my reading desk. Second is pretty slow. Actually, yeah, it is. Yeah, so you, you can probably do it. I mean, like, Persona 5, right? <laughs> so I'm sorry to insert Persona into another show. <laughs> but, um. Oh, Sam, we should have done a Persona 5 fan fiction. Yeah, that would, not, that would not have been good. Uh, I thought, maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> can we come up with one later, maybe? Like, I Actually, guess. Persona 6 is going to be... That's not going to be the show. You can't whoever's show is that on. Read well, it we off. do have actually a whole hour dedicated to Persona 5 fiction in a way. Um, <laughs> so we're going to so, we're gonna but, read... Oh, do you have the... Yeah, yeah 47 days yeah. straight, um, which is at, you're at, at the most if you're reading like word per second. And considering that we played video games really for longer than that, if you do it by a rip, then it should be all right. Mm. You know what? Yeah, it's pathetic. You should do more. Yeah. You should be twice as long. Yeah, you should. So we're gonna, that's his name. That, by the way. <laughs> we're going to read, uh, Jim has sent over at FanVision. Jim can't be here today. Oh, not because he's dead. He is he's, dead, though. Well, mm. he might be. We don't know. I've not heard from him in a few hours. Uh, he sent over, he's reading a fanfiction about Bob Ross. And he's, oh. he's included a picture. Oh. oh. I don't know if the camera can see that. Uh, he's included a picture. So this squirrel. is called The Burden of Painting with Bob Ross. Bob lifted his comically large palette before turning to the camera. He didn't have a squirrel today, so he opened the show with a hello, like a normal person, instead of with a squirrel. Is it like the view adverts? It's like, hello. No, sorry. <laughs> we didn't really see the picture that well. Can we see it again? They want to see the picture. I don't really want to. There we go. Oh, thank you. They want to see the picture. There we go. Okay. <coughs> now is it going to be too close? <laughs> <laughs> Viewers have been disappointed he didn't paint with the squirrel, or indeed paint with the squirrel, <laughs> last time it had been on the show, and despite Bob's protestations that the squirrel had been found confused, malnourished, and addicted to crocodile in the paint <coughs> aisle of a B&Q, and therefore may be rightly traumatised by being dunked in paint, the producers were adamant, if it were to be seen on the show again, then quote, the little rat's twonk's head better get smeared with some gosh darn matte finish and smeared on a canvas, or Bob would never work again. Therefore, Bob thought it best to leave... Therefore, Bob thought it best that Peapod, for that was its name, stay off the show in future. Well, isn't today a lovely day, Bob chimed to the camera. And if it isn't lovely, where are you? Then maybe you just need to take a closer look. There's always good somewhere near you, whether it's in the rhythmic beat, ridden... I can't say words. <laughs> rhythmic beat of a thundercloud or the warm glow of the blood from a stab wound. You can always, always find something to be happy about. The names of, the names of Bob's painted oil paint started to display in front of him. But he didn't know that because they were superimposed in later. So he just assumed they would be there. And they would. Midnight blue, vintage pink, anaconda green. The colours came thick and fast, much like the oil paints from Bob's delivery service, Bobel. Macaroon white, <coughs> Simpson yellow, sky black. The colours kept coming. Kiwi green, banana yellow, Wait. orange orange. Sorry, what's the yellow again? Banana yellow. What was the one before that? Kiwi green. No, been yellow before that. Simpson yellow. Right? Simpson yellow. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> <laughs> Crispy blue, rainbow everything, window invisible, sadness grey, regret purple, befuddlement mauve. All these colours and more were required for today's painting. As the list continued, Bob told a cute anecdote. Not that any viewer would be able to hear it, given they were frantically trying to check they had all the correct shades of red as they flashed on the screen. Eight in total. That's every shade. This was in a time when the notion of pausing live TV was a mere fancy. Don't re be ridiculous, said the boffins at Sony. Live TV is happening right now. <coughs> that means if you stop it, then you stop the whole world. We can't put that power in people's homes. <laughs> Bob began by revealing that he'd already put a layer of white on the canvas, which annoyed all the viewers because this meant they were already behind. He began by putting the brush to canvas, and within mere, mere moments, he had painted all of the sky. He then added the sea and then the land, complete with several trees. He put splodges on the grass and soon became apparent that these were animals. Deer grazing and foxes stalking. He added lines between the waves and these were fishes of all kinds. He moved his brush to add one final tree, but scuffed the tip of the canvas. He smiled kindly. That's okay. In painting, there are no mistakes. Only happy accidents. So he returned to the mark he'd made and added two arms, two legs and a head. It was then that a baby bird emerged from the nest that Bob had made in his hair. 
squeaking in irritation. Oh, of course, time for your lunch, Alejandro. <laughs> With that, Bob left the painting for a few minutes in search of vegetarian worms for his child. When Bob returned, he noticed something had changed about the painting. There was a house beside his latest addition to the painting. He didn't remember painting a house, but maybe it had come out in the process. The tree he'd painted was gone. There was a deer missing too. In fact, there were two of those figures he'd originally made by mistake, and he was certain he'd just made the one. Oh, I guess you have a friend now, he said, confused. What a happy accident. Bob blinked and then looked again. There were fewer trees now, and there was a large, tall structure next to the settlement. Now five houses. It was a pale wood cylinder stripped of its bark with a large bush atop its smiling face and a wolf carcass for a moustache. For a brief moment, Bob's grin faltered. That's the joy of painting, I suppose, he said, not quite certain of himself. You never know what you'll end up with till the end. Bob painted, dabbed his brush in the biker black and child's ghost costume with whites, white paints on his palette and dabbed two cows and a <laughs> calf on the grass near the settlement. Bob turned to take a sip of pink lemonade, flamingo pink specifically. He was surprised again when he turned back to his canvas. He was certain now. <coughs> he hadn't drawn boats in the sea. Thirteen <coughs> houses and a spiked wooden fence around the cows. He looked at the figures. They were on their knees, their arms held aloft. The fields were empty, so he, so he added some wheat. Bob left the painting for a few minutes to drop a, drop a bob, bobby jobby. <coughs> Colour was turned brown, unsurprisingly. And returned to his canvas to see it changed again. There were now two settlements, one bearing deer antlers and the other wolf pets. <coughs> And between the two stood two armies of the figures. There was red on the grass. He didn't remember adding. Some of the figures were lying down and some of their arms aloft again. He looked at the painting for a while and realised it was too symmetrical. Asymmetry being the secret to great painting. He frowned and picked up a wide brush and coated the army on the right with one of the only colours he had left. Blood red. The figures continued to make offerings to Bob and he continued to oblige them, though it was becoming more exhausting. He was saddened by the amount of grey in the sky and he had run out of sky blue to fix it. In fact, the grey seemed to be the only colour that he was, it was in plentiful supply. The buildings were not so colourful now. Grey monoliths rising up to the grey sky, inhabited by figures in grey costumes with grey faces. Rarely was the grass green now. The cows, previously petite yet evo evocative splodges, had grown to improbable sizes. The composition was terrible. They were, too, they were much too big and drew the eye immediately. Not all the figures were grey. Some wore nothing at all as trudged through the muds of, mud of the fields, hundreds of them watching by one of the figures in grey. It did not bother Bob so much as intrigue him that the figures no longer raised their arms aloft to him or carved great totems, not in his honour anyway. It was not long before Bob could see, not see the sky, nor the grass, not see the sea, nor the grass. The painting soon became a mass of greys and blacks and browns, an abstract piece that even the greatest Picasso apologist would struggle to interpret. Bob, had, Bob hadn't slept for days as he tried his best to fix the painting to create what he had in his mind so long ago. He took out a cigarette, something he hadn't done since the time in the war. <laughs> he lit the match and brought the, a glorious flame to the cigarette. We don't make mistakes, he whispered as much to himself as the camera. Only happy accidents. He flicked the match from between his fingers. It landed on the canvas. A happy accident. <laughs> My parents said I was a happy accident. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, Sam. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah? Yeah, it's very good actually. It's very good because it went deep into the Bob Ross kind of like mythos. <laughs> I, do, I do have a, 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 stick, a stickling point, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, he didn't use the two most iconic Bob Ross paint colours, Van Dyke Brown and Liquid White. Yes, Liquid White. <laughs> and there's also Phalo Blue. Well. Phalo Blue. Um, but I, yeah, Bob Ross actually did collect animals, little animals that were. Um, like I only recently watched. I watched my first Bob Ross at the. We did a Bob I Ross. Never watched it I never Bob watched it. I haven't watched Bob Ross yet. Yes. Yep. I'm Have gonna. You? No. I'm gonna start painting Bob Ross actually. Um, I got some canvases at home, and I'm trying to do it with my auntie. But you know, it's. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I I enjoyed that. It was. Uh, you know. Your painting was pretty good. But both of yours were. Both it's it's really good. easy to do, isn't it? Yeah. But that fa that fan fiction. Yeah, really good. It, it captures the thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, li I like I like the Bob uh, Bobby Jobby bit. That was good. <laughs> oh, it's quite good. good. Um, uh, yeah. I yeah. like I like also like how he's like losing all his sanity while painting. This. Like, <laughs> I think it, I think it has like more value than just fic fan fiction. It's I think a different it's more side written. to Bob Ross. Yeah, he used to actually be in the military, you know, Bob mm. Ross, and that's yeah. why you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Um, he he actually was just uh, yeah, and so he never. 
he said he'd never raise his voice again because he shouted at He does speak very soft. Yeah. He does, yeah. yeah. Right, are we ready for 10 fun facts about fan fiction? Yeah. 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 Number oh, one. Yeah. From one fun fact to 10. Number no, 10 now. Them. These are quick fire. Number one, every fan fiction must contain at least three spelling mistakes and inconsistent punctuation in order for it to be posted. Mm -hmm. Number two, 90% of the people who read your smutty stories <coughs> are under the appropriate age of 18. <laughs> Number three, every time a Harry Potter fan fiction gets posted, J.K. Rowling grows a little stronger. <laughs> <laughs> Number four, every year on the 20th of June, fan fiction writers everywhere gather to burn an effigy of E.L. James. So the Fifty That's, Shades of Grey. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <context. laughs> Number five, when a writer gets their readers to care even the slightest bit about their OCs, they receive an official You're Good at Fan Fiction award. <laughs> Number six, the earliest form of fan fiction was in fact the Bible. <laughs> Number seven, fan fiction that ships Hermione and Draco is so powerful that if you reread Harry Potter, you'll realise that they actually end up together at the end. Wow. <laughs> Number eight, before fan fiction, gay people did not exist. <laughs> Number nine, when fan fiction is written about real life people, they lose 27 days of their life. And I can only apologize to Colin Moffrey for that. <laughs> and finally, number 10, the youngest person to write fan fiction was just three months old. It was a gender bent, orange is the new black fan fiction. And it was terrible. <laughs> wow. There we have it. That's my 10 fun facts. Those were great. Thank you. I like and now, because we're on camera, and I, this isn't a show that lends itself to visuals, I thought I'll put a tiny visual element in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to... I've gonna got a tiny visual element. I'm going to dress up for you as a, a typical fan fiction writer. So if you want to be a fan fiction writer, what you need is a hoodie. We have a Lucy logo. I'm Lucy well, hoodie. I was say, this is a Lucy hoodie, which is inaccurate, because if you're writing fan fiction, you do not go to university. Oh, wow. I meant because you're young, not because uh, you're okay. thick. Okay. Double standard. And you have to put your... Oh, wait. Scrunchie. Scrunchie? <laughs> scrunchie. You mean to, a bubble? To, no, this one's a specifically a scrunchie. To tie up your hair with. A hey, nice scrunchie. So you can oh my God, concentrate. Working. And you've got to put up the hood. As you sit, because you'll be sitting in the dark. And I also have. Now, this didn't exist back when I was writing fan fiction. Uh, um, oh, this is a snuggie. It's a blanket. With oh, no, I'm Amanda. Which I never, ha I never got to wear one of these, but I'm assuming if I'm assuming this is what all the fan fiction kids are wearing nowadays. Aww. You like. There we go. You're like, like a, a druid or something. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> it's actually, it's not bad actually. You're you like, like right. you're about to go oh. sacrifice someone. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually white, but yeah, it's actually like, stained with the blood of her sacrifices. Okay. I <laughs> watch through the door. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised. We're going to read Cesar's fanfic. We have someone who's actually written uh, one yeah, who's on the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're, you've written a Hunger Games fanfic, yeah. I believe. The typo is in the title because I call it Hunger Game. Oh, um, Hunger, Hunger Games. Hunger Games. Game. Game. <laughs> Maybe it's because it's about the first Hunger Games. Mm. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. They don't. They don't know there's going to be more. It's like World War One. They're probably just like, oh, can't. I love World War One. <laughs> yeah. The Hunger Game <laughs> to end all games. Okay. Um. So, did you have a title? You just called it the Hunger Game fiction. Uh, no title. No I don't title. think it, it's okay. so short. It doesn't need a title. Okay. The hunger dominates my body and my brain. Actually, do you want to read it or should I read it? Uh, I can read it if you want me yeah, to. Yeah, given you're here. It should have a character you'll, you'll, you'll know the intonation. I hope it has a character that just goes, I'm so hungry. <laughs> I'm, I could really eat right now. <laughs> and also, I've got this big Monopoly board <laughs> game. <laughs> I'm just so hungry. <laughs> I could eat Mackies right now. <laughs> yes. Pod placement. The hunger dominates my body and my brain. I can run. I can move. I can think. Are you all right? <laughs> it says. I don't answer. I don't waste my. I don't want to waste my energy. Katniss, Peter insists, we have to move. I can hear barking behind me. Peter's right. I got to move. But can I? I'm resting on Peter's shoulder. He's trying to carry me. But I think this is it. He drops me. My face hits the ground. The grass is cold. It reminds me of home. District 12. I never thought I'd miss that bunch of grey decay houses, decaying houses. The dogs are upon us. Peter's trying to fight them. How long can he hold them off, I don't know. He was never a fighter, that's for sure. But he's a trier. I must give him that. He always tries. 
a cannon. The sound breaks through the uh, grunts of the dogs. Is he dead? Is Peter dead? Am I dead? I look up. Peter's still fighting the dogs, doing his best to keep them away from me. He's such a sweetheart. I wish we had more time. But I don't think the dogs will give us that. Thinking is tedious. My mental processes are slow. It takes me a while to realize that if the dogs hasn't killed Peter yet, that means that the cannon was announcing someone else's death. Then the career is dead. Then it's only Peter and I. Then we've won. But then why are the dogs still here? They said that we could win together. They said that Oh, I see. I understand now. Stand up, Katniss. There's one more thing we have to do. I don't know how, but I'm standing. Maybe it's a desire to win these games uh, what gives me strength. Peter still fight, is still fighting the dogs. <sighs> his left hand is gone. And he has a pretty big wound on his left leg. I don't know how he's standing. Maybe it's a desire to end these games what gives him strength. I walk towards him. He notices me. He turns and looks at me. In pain and surprise. Katniss, he says. Peter, I say. I stab Peter on his chest, right through his heart. He looks into my eyes. He's crying. He didn't think I was capable of doing something like this. Just because he wouldn't be able to do something like this. <coughs> the dogs stop barking and they surround us, staring at us. Peter falls to the ground and as soon as his body touches the floor, the dogs leave. I can't hold myself. I need food. As I fall to the ground, I hear a voice. Katniss Evergreen, the voice shouts excited. You're the 74th Hunger Games victor. Who's victor? <laughs> <laughs> that was a... It's my cousin. That was harrowing, that. That was a serious one. Yeah. Yeah. I was waiting for them to be like, well, I guess I won. Did it, did it. Because I knew what this show was going to be about. I wanted to do something different, do a serious one. Okay. Sorry if that was no, disappointing. Bob Robson was pretty serious. Yeah, so pretty oh, <laughs> I think the Bob Ross yeah, was, was better. Yeah. <laughs> I Bob think Bob Jobby. Was oh. Bobby Jobby. And Bob I mean, having to feed like a, a bird in his <laughs> hair with vegetarian worms. He, he, he is the worst character, so I don't mind that he died. Oh, <laughs> He's not I, a good character. That's the only good thing about this one fiction. Yeah. Peter dies. Oh. So I found an article written by CNN while I was researching, uh, and it was basically a parent's guide to fan fiction. So it was basically to help parents understand what it is and why their children might like it. Oh. And it, it's not actually that bad. I thought, it, I thought it'd be really like, oh my God, keep children away from fan fiction. But it was actually like quite positive. Um, but the only thing I took issue with was that it gave definitions for like fan fiction terminology. Oh no. And it, it gave an example. And I wasn't quite sure of their choice of an example of a ship. So it, it said, um, shipping, much of fan fiction revolves around <laughs> shipping, which is the romantic pairing of characters. Often, there's a call from fans to ship specific characters, say Harry Styles and Bella from Twilight. Mm, <laughs> don't really see it. Who's Harry yeah, Styles? Oh, you know, boy, one, direction, one of the boys in One Direction. Really? Yeah. But like, they're not even in the same. Yeah, you know, universe. Pop no. scene, I know. So. I, I think ship is u shipping is usually like in the same universe, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I had a Google. And it does. It's real. Oh. They've obviously done their research. I found one. It's what, called. What's it called? New Beginnings. As Bella's finally over Edward, she's got a new boyfriend who just so happens to be the famous Harry Styles of One Direction. Now it's time for Harry to meet the family, but Bella doesn't expect for Edward or the Cullen family to be back in Forks. Oh. What will Edward do? <laughs> Read and find out. Does this does that fan fiction also happen to be written by the person who wrote the parents' guide? He didn't know what shipping was things. exactly, so create, okay. she, he created one. I've got a little extract. Says, this is from Bella. I've moved on, Edward. I love someone else, and I love him a hell of a lot more than I could have ever. <laughs> a monster like you. You're controlling, and we're always putting me down. Harry loves all my flaws, and I love his. Please go and never come back. 
I don't ever want to see your face again, I said as I walked out of my bedroom and down the stairs to go how to go it just says to go to oh to go to Harry. I thought it said just to go Harry. <laughs> to uh, go Harry. And then it just has a little heading that says Edward's point of view. Uh, I couldn't believe that Bella, my Bella, would ever speak to me like that. She must be insane. That's the only explanation for my Bella not running back into my arms. That and that stupid boy, Harry. He must have brainwashed her into thinking she loves him. He must have taken advantage of her in the States after I left. And he used it. I will get my Bella back, no matter what it takes. So yeah, so that is... uh, (laughs) Uh, um, to be fair, I, I'm a big fan of Twilight. Really? Um, in, in, in a sarcastic way. Oh, okay. Um, I, I seriously, like, what's the movies? Like, it, I think they're beautiful um, in their own way. Oh. But I think, I think the language is not that far away from actual Twilight. Fair enough. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to read Jordan's story. <gasps> How um, oh, no. Have we got? We've got Did Jordan's, and, we've, and Eddie might have sent one, and then we've got mine. And I've never written for this show before. Um, have you so, not? It's your first no. time. I, I have written one for Persona 5, by the way. If you Wait, are that. you kidding? Yeah, me and Jake okay. are going to... Oh, okay, yeah. Eddie, Eddie has his indicating. So if you have time. Okay, if we have time. So I'm going to read Jordan's. I don't, again, I don't know what it's for. Okay, I've seen Hogwarts, so I guess it's Harry Potter. Oh, I, I sent me over, He's sending me over Messenger, so there's no formatting. Oh, Apologies <laughs> if I missed. I thought, I thought he was going to do a uh, fan fiction of the Timer for Chronicles. Let, let's find out. It's John Sutterfield's favourite word processor is Facebook Messenger. It was, it was young John Arbuckle's first day at the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft. <laughs> and John Arbuckle? He had been excited to arrive ever since he, brought, he was brought the letter by his dog, Odin. Uh, while he was confused... Oh, for God's sake! Oh, I see what's happening. <laughs> as to why, at the age of 46, he was being accepted into a magic school for people of the ages of 18 to 18, he knew straight away that it was his destiny to become the greatest wizard the world had ever seen. At platform nine and three quarters, he ran into the people he knew straight away would be his best friends. Hi, I'm Garfield Lasagna, said a young wizard. And this is Heathcliff Wesley. We are your new best friends. You love us. John Arbuckle was considerably taller than most of the other wizards at Hogwarts because he was an adult. John decided to try a magic spell on the magic school bus, which was picking them up to go to Hogwarts. But it made the bus evil and they nearly didn't get to school, but they did. Hello. I'm Jim Davis, said the headmaster. Jim David. Jim Davis then clapped his hands and the magical cat made a fire rolled around above everyone's heads and they cheered. Everyone except Nerm, Nermal Bad Name, who was evil but misunderstood, but also made really bad decisions. It's time to be sorted into the five houses. Good house, bad house, unnecessary house, <laughs> large adult sun house, and the Lancaster University Comedy Institute. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Lancaster University Comedy in- Institute, asked Garfield. <laughs> Welcome to Lancaster University Comedy Institute's official website. We are the only society dedicated to performing and writing comedy at Lancaster. We hold weekly meetings every Friday for sketch comedy and stand-up and improv workshops. For more information, click on the links below. <laughs> stand-up sketch improv, or if you're not interested in performing and just want to come along with some light relief from coursework, come and join us at the County Comedy Club Every Friday, Friday. Friday. Or listen to each Sunday at one o'clock on Bell Rig FM for our new weekly panel show. J- said Jim. That sounds interesting. I hope I'm sorted into that house. Said Heathcliff. It's time for the sorting. John Arbuckle, you're in unnecessary house. Garfield, we are making a special house for you. Heathcliff, you're in bad house. Everyone in the room cheered. Oh, <laughs> John, it's great that you're in unnecessary house. Said Garfield. That means you don't have an opinion on anything. <laughs> That's the best way to get through life. Change in society is too difficult to enact. The inherent problems in wizard society are not worth fixing because they don't cause any outright harm to me as of yet, and I want to be a wizard cop. <laughs> cool, said John Arbuckle. John Arbuckle felt a big pain on his bum. Ouch, this scar on my backside hurts. That's probably Lord Dim- Dilbert Mort. Dilbert. He's dead because he tried to kill you. The last part of his name means death to show Dilbert. you he was bad. But he's not coming back. I'm back, said Lord Dilbert Mort, <laughs> and some people who didn't really matter. Dog Cementius, said John Arbuckle, and a giant magic cup appeared above Lord Dilbert Mort's mouth and he drank its contents. <laughs> then Liz from Garfield came and told him he was pregnant with a litter of puppies. And then he died. In the end, John Arbuckle became the president of the Lancaster University Comedy Institute and died happy at the age of 43 when he tripped over an easy bake oven in the end. <sighs> I believe some of that was copied and pasted. Yeah. The, uh, Lancaster well, University it's Friday. Yeah. It's, just comedy it's just Friday because... Back when Friday Night was written, Joker Yoke used to be County Comedy Club on um, Friday night. Yeah, yeah, that was our first, mine and Sam's first Jesus. year. Ham's, ha, 
Ham's Hammer's second year. Yeah. And then I had to go in the JCR exact just so I could change it back to first day. <laughs> with your oh, beautiful posters, everything is possible yeah. with some or anything is possible. Uh, and I've lived that sin ever since. I should never have done it. It's too much effort. No, um yeah. That was very good. I like that. You can tell exactly where it was going <laughs> as yeah. soon as you heard it was written by Jordan Summerfield. Okay, so next we've got one from Eddie. He's literally just sent this over now. So it's called Dan and Shelley. It says, you can censor it as, as you want. I don't think it swears too bad, but feel free to change it if it's too naughty. Okay, well... Uh, how can you? How are you going to be able to pick up on the fly? I'm not. I'm going to just do it. Can I read it? Okay. <laughs> gonna get into trouble because of this. Dan Gleanob is my favourite adult film star. And when I say adult films, I don't mean snoozeville films that adults watch like Avatar and Titanic. I mean proper adult sex films with love making and complex family relationships. I'm talking Milf delivers pizza. I'm talking <coughs> Stepdaughter asks for directions. I'm talking S P L A S H Sexy Pals brackets who of anal surgical hospital. <coughs> Let's be real, Dan Gleanop is very good at sex, <coughs> but he's not only good at sex, he's also a really good and special guy. I'm going to tell you about the time that Dan Gleanop met my TV hero, Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> little thing you got to know about Sheldon, or Shelly as I like to call him, he's very smart. And this smart cookie ain't got time for jocks and basic B words who stimmy his intellect. He doesn't pay, play by the rules. He's a maverick. So when one day Sheldon was telling some women why they were wrong about Star Wars, and he bumped into Dan Gleanob, it was like two nice stars had eaten each other up and morphed into the biggest, nicest star. I had an orgasm. And I didn't even know why. Hey Sheldon, said Dan. I've not seen you around before. How come? Well, I'm usually at the comic book store. I only came to the pawn shack to tell these two young ladies that the script for Empire Strikes Back originally said, I killed your father, so there was a surprise for the cast, but they don't believe me. Is he autistic? said one of the girls. It's never made clear, replied Sheldon. <laughs> the girls left the shop, still not clearly understanding the might of Sheldon's intellect. Damn, said Sheldon. Poor idiot humans, I feel sorry for them. You're so smart, said Dan, and surprisingly sexy. Sheldon blushed and brushed his hair with his wiry but strong hands. Dan, said Sheldon, would you help me deliver this letter to William Shatner? It says how much I love him, and how I always knew that Star Trek was better than Wars. And I don't mean real ones, <coughs> like Gulf or Two, but more like, but more important ones, like Star. Sure, sure thing, Shelley. If I can call you that, Dan blushed. He never blushed. They went straight to William Shatner's house and posted the letter. This was rather, rather uneventful, but it is not the important part of this story. Thanks for doing that, Dan, said Shelley. Do you want to go to Cheesecake Factory and discuss ethics and games journalism? Sure thing, Shelley, whispered Dan, essentially. But first, tell me why you're so gosh darn sexually repressed. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that, said Sheldon. I think we should have evolved past man's calm <coughs> obsession. But really, it's because I'm a virgin. You want me to show you how? Oh, I couldn't possibly. Sheldon was so embarrassed, his Star Trek t-shirt fell off. <laughs> he got an erection, which threw his trousers off across the room. Wait. <laughs> Sorry, this never happens. It's okay, said Dan. Let me take you now. The two manly lovers rubbed their bodies together. When their bodies collided, they fused like two sexy hydrogen atoms, except it was not helium that was produced, but love. <laughs> As Sheldon climaxed, he screamed, Bazinga! <laughs> this is better than Firefly. <laughs> After the sex, Sheldon could barely stand up. It was like gym class all over again. <coughs> Thank you, said Sheldon. Wait till I show Amy. You don't need to tell Amy, said Dan. I'm your man. Amy doesn't get you and her brain is small and weak. Biology. Not exactly physics, is it? You're not exactly clever either, said Sheldon. Oh, really? Dan pulled out his PhD thesis, which was entitled The Physics of Space. What? That was you, Sheldon cried? That's my favourite PhD thesis. 
Sheldon and Dan hugged and had another sex. <laughs> Once they were done, Dan said to Sheldon, I have something to tell you, Dan said. Dan grabbed his neck and pulled off a rubber mask to reveal his true identity. Leonard! exclaimed Sheldon. That's right. I was your man all along. <laughs> Leonard and Sheldon walked home hand in hand. Their raw sexual chemistry was enough to power the broken lift all the way up to the stairs. <laughs> where they lived forever and did research which proved their theories, theories were right. And that was the story of how I discovered my favourite porn star was Leonard Hofstetter. Lovely. You <laughs> So I was like, oh, it's a crossover, but then at the end, it wasn't. <laughs> it was very reminiscent of Eddie's, Eddie's uh, the story you go through for Ernest Klein last year. <laughs> so, it's, it's the only sexual one we've had. Y- you can tell in the intonation of how he writes, though. He's got a very distinct style. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, as I said, I've written one. I've never actually written one for the show, because all the people have always just done it for me. <laughs> and I spent ages trying to figure out what I was going to write, because fan fiction is... Because I'm obviously a, actually like fan fiction and actually write it seriously. Yeah. I was like, how am I going to do this and not do it seriously? Well, so the problem is that fan fiction is often uh, born from an obsession. But t- you tend to be obsessed with shows and stuff when you're kind of younger, like when you're 16 years old and you're on Tumblr and stuff. Mm. So I was, you know, when you're all, I don't really have that much obsessions with like shows anymore. So I was like, what can I write? <clears throat> what am I like? Sort of what what levels of obsessive love do I sort of, sort of reach for something? And there's only two things, and that's RuPaul's Drag Race. And the Lancaster University Comedy Institute. Oh no! Oh, yes. So we anyone who's ever read, read fan fiction knows that crossovers are terrible. <laughs> but given that it's terrible and I don't want to write something good, it's perfect. So here is a RuPaul Drag Race oh, Lancaster yes. University Institute crossover that nobody was asking for. <laughs> <clears throat> it's me, bitches. Edward Dearden bursts through the door <laughs> to, to the workroom. He had on a gaudy pink feather boa and a sequin jumpsuit. He struck a sensual pose for the camera for far too long. So long, in fact, that Andrew had to go and get him and drag him back to his seat. I can't believe you're going along with this, Andrew said, flicking one of Eddie's silver sparkles off his nipples. Ow! Eddie cowered away. I'm just giving it a go. I think I make a really attractive woman. You haven't shaved your beard off, Kyle pointed out. He himself had donned one of the huge blonde wigs that had been provided, but he was still wearing ugly man clothes. (laughs) So far, only Eddie had gotten into the spirit of things. Eddie stroked his facial hair. I think it adds to it. Bearded Lady. Season 7 of RuPaul's Drag Race had a beard challenge. (coughs) Bearded and beautiful. Eddie was met with stares. Hannah watches a lot of Drag Race. Eddie, don't be such a cook, Andrew said. Punching Jake in the arm for no reason. (laughs) Jake rubbed his arm. I think Jim will have an unfair advantage of his long hair. Jim smiled. Well, I don't think it's quite the size or flamboyantness that they they (coughs) expect on this show. I mean, I haven't watched it, so I wouldn't know. I'm not taking part, Andrew asserted. He ripped off, he ripped the wig off Kyle's head and threw it to the ground. He had, had the work room been anywhere near as populated as, with gay men as it normally was, there perhaps would have been some gasps. The thing is, I don't think we have a choice, Kyle said ominously. <laughs> they all knew what he meant. None of them knew why they had woken up in RuPaul's <coughs> Drag Race workroom, but they had been there for hours and no one had come to explain what was going on. They had, only re- they had reached the conclusion that they were all having a simultaneous nightmare that they all had to compete in RuPaul's Drag Race. It was the only explanation. I'm Spanish, said Cesar in Spanish. But no, one, <laughs> but no one could understand what he said because they did not speak Spanish. <laughs> the door at the top of the stairs suddenly swung open and RuPaul strolled in wearing a bright green suit covered in sequins looking suave as hell. Hello, 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 he sang as he descended the steps to meet them at the bottom. Like in the format of the normal show, the boys all swarmed in front of him to find out what the hell was going on. Welcome to RuPaul's Drag Race, RuPaul greeted them, holding his arms out wide. But rather than applause, he was met with blank stares. What the hell is going on, Andrew demanded. RuPaul grinned at them all. You six gorgeous ladies have been selected to become part of an exclusive club. You lucky few have been chosen to compete on this year's season of RuPaul's Drag Race. Excuse me, how did we get here? Jim asked, trying a more subtle approach. Ru feigned shock. Wait! Did I say six of you? I mean, the seven of you. Oh, pit crew! He called towards the double doors in the wall, which opened to reveal two muscular men who were naked other than for a pair of tiny pink thongs. They wheeled a giant box into the room. Rue patted the top of the box. Mmm, look at those tight buns. The pit crew boys turned around to show off their tight buns. (laughs) Those buns are pretty tight, Kyle admitted. 
<laughs> now let's see what's inside. Roo stood back in the box rustled. The lid flung forward and from out of the box came a new contender for the race. It was Jordan Summerfield. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, he said. For fuck's sake, groaned Jake. <laughs> Jordan will be joining you as the seventh contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race, Roo announced as Jordan stepped out of the box. Now for your main challenge. I want you to strut your stuff down the runway. Category is animal chic realness. Roo looked directly into the camera. Hashtag drag race. This all make a lot more sense if you guys watch Drag Race. I've watched it. <laughs> I don't know what Drag Race is. You still makes haven't, complete sense to me. Yeah. You still haven't told us what the hell is going on, Andrew protested. You can use fabrics from the fabric wall and jewellery provided by Fierce Drag Jewels. Good luck. And with that, <laughs> RuPaul disappeared in a puff of smoke. The boys were left alone with nothing but the workroom, Jordan's transportation box, and two hot guys who were still there for some reason. Well, obviously I'm not getting in drag, Andrew said. Spanish nonsense, Spanish nonsense, agreed Cesar. Possibly. No one knew. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! RuPaul was back in the room with them. Oh, by the way, I should yeah. probably mention, anyone who refuses to take part will be killed. Hashtag drag race. <laughs> he disappeared again and the boys all looked at each other. Damn, I regret agreeing to do this now, Jordan said. You signed up for this? Jim asked incredulously. Jordan shrugged. Well, I thought it was a literal drag race. That explains why you're wearing a Formula One racing suit, Eddie said, helping himself to a leopard print fabric on the wall. <laughs> what are you doing, Andrew asked. Well, you heard him. We have no choice. That is true, Andrew, Jim said. Surely you'd like to... You, surely you dress as a woman to save your life. No, I would not, Andrew insisted, and he fell to the floor, dying immediately. <laughs> Spanish nonsense! Spanish nonsense! Cesar exclaimed in shock. Oh, God, he's serious, Kyle said, running to the fabric wall and dragging down a big piece of leopard, leopard print. I guess we're doing this, boys, said Jordan, lowering his driving helmet in a dramatic fashion. <laughs> he did then have to lift it off again immediately in order to get into his drag outfit. <laughs> what followed was a montage of the remaining contestants, Eddie, Jim, Jordan, Cesar, Kyle and Jake, getting into their outfits, wigs and makeup so that, they could, so that they didn't die at the hands of RuPaul. Eddie did indeed shave off his beard for authenticity. Jordan forgot what the task was immediately and put on a glitzy ball gown that had nothing to do with animal chic. After a few hours, they were ready and the pit crew took them to the main stage. As they approached the stage, they could hear the title sequence playing in the distance. The winner of RuPaul's Drag Race receives a one-year supply of Anastasia <laughs> Beverly Hills Cosmetics and $100,000 with extra special guest judges Hannah Wesson and David Duncan. <laughs> what? Uh. The boys all stared at each other. Jim was confused. Hannah and Dave? Oh, it all makes sense now, Jordan said. Does it? Jake asked. No. Kyle sighed. Well, this isn't fair. Eddie has an advantage. Oh, I don't think I do. I've shaved off the beard, so I don't think she'll like me now. Oh. Our whole relationship hinges on me having a beard. <laughs> <laughs> on the main stage, Rue was strutting his, his stuff in a full-length gown, looking fine. And then it does the intro bit. Cover girl, put the bass in your <laughs> one. Head to toe, let your whole body talk. And what? Welcome to the main stage of RuPaul's Drag Race. Applause followed Rue's introduction. Hannah, are you glad to be here? Rue asked to the judges. Oh, I'm living my dream, Rue. Literally, I think this might be my dream right now that I'm having while I'm asleep. <laughs> Rue smiled. And David, are you having fun? Dave sat up straighter in his seat. Oh, I literally could not be having more fun right now, Rue. This is my dream come true for me. Well, probably Hannah's, Hannah's dream, because I think if this was my dream, I would literally be you, Rue. <laughs> Rue laughed. Gentlemen, start your engines and may the best woman win. The, one, the runway began. The six remaining contestants took to the stage to flaunt their animal chic outfits to compete for the title of America's next drag superstar, very much against their will. Throughout the runway, Rue, Hannah and Dave made various innuendos related to their outfits, such as, wow, take a look at that pussy, and I don't think under Jordan understands what's going on at all. The six drag queens then stood at the front of the stage, ready for judgment. Dave went first. Boys, I loved it. You were all spicy hot. So hot, I think my nutsack is actually on fire. Someone get me a cool, tasty beverage to cool down the spiciness of what I've just seen. We're running low on time, Rue said, getting up from his seat. So I'm going to crown the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race right now. Rue took to the stage and the pit crew brought on the crown and scepter. The winner of RuPaul's Drag Race, America's next drag superstar is... A drum roll started up from nowhere. It's me, Rue cried. <laughs> the fanfare started, the pit crew placed the crown on Rue's head and handed him the scepter. He braided up and down the stage, waving to his adoring fans. The Lucy boys didn't understand what was happening. No one understood. Had this really all been a hallucination? A dream? Hannah woke with a start in her bed. Whoa! She tapped Eddie on the shoulder beside her. I just had the weirdest dream. Eddie rolled over and Hannah screamed. His beard was missing. <laughs> Eddie propped himself up on his elbows. 
Honey, Shantae, you stay. <laughs> That's, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Uh, that was magnificent. A, that was a fun time. I'm glad I wasn't in. Oh one. god, we're just we're coming to the end now. But before we go, next, Jake Black and Sam Parsons. Real yeah. quick, so we can take as long as we yeah. want. <laughs> oh, okay. In celebration of, of RuPaul, <coughs> I've got some official RuPaul buttons. We oh, will for you guys. Oh, wonderful! As stressed as I would love those. There's the Shante, you stay. Sashay away. You better work. Don't fuck it up. Reading is fundamental and charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. Would you like a. Jake, which button would you like? Can I have sachet away? You can have sachet away. I think it's magnetic. Oh. So but don't fuck it up. There you are. Where'd you get these from? <laughs> My friend got them. <laughs> <laughs> so there, I, I hope everyone enjoyed the, the fan fiction. I sure uh, did. Is it, so is it a magnet underneath or something? How does it work? I. I I have no idea. I guess it's for the fridge, maybe. It's oh, rubbish, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Huh? It's rubbish, isn't it? Wow, <laughs> it's free. Okay, yeah. Uh, is that your snuggie hammer? It literally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is. Me, me and Jake, uh, we didn't actually. Well, you were gonna. I was gonna read a fan fiction off my phone, but it'd just be a blank page, and we would just make it up as we went along. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but wow. I guess, I guess Persona Six at eight p eight a.m. tomorrow is gonna be um. As trying to make it up on the spot, um, so you probably will get the same thing then if you want to watch them. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, thanks everyone. That has been the fan fiction hour. It'll probably never happen again, but who knows? Never again. Well, I'll I'll probably still be here. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. So who knows? So you can start working on the fan fiction now for next year. I'll have to get right in. <laughs> I'm um gonna get drunk. Okay. <sighs> Right. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a tasty coat, I know you feel like you want me, and I guess in a way you do. All of my breath, all reveling emotions. I need some space to think this through. Call me up.